Welcome to the Sense of Soul podcast. We are your hosts, Shannon and Mandy. Grab your coffee, open your mind, heart, and soul. It's time to awaken. Hey friends, if you're looking for ad-free Sense of Soul episodes, you can find them at Sense of Soul Patreon. Become a monthly member at any level. You will also have access to our monthly SOS Sacred Circles, our mini series, merch, and much more. And it's a great way to help support our podcast so that we can continue to bring you inspiring episodes twice a week with our enlightened guests from all around the world. Check out our Patreon. Happy New Year's. Today with us, we have Subhash Jan. He is a professor emeritus in the Department of Civil Environmental Engineering at the University of Iowa. After retiring in 2003, he concentrated on studying Indian philosophy, particularly the Jan Karma Doctrine, and has a PhD degree in Janology from the University of Madras. He has published two books and several articles in journals and magazines on the karma doctrine. And today he's here with us to talk about his new book, The Path to Inner Peace, Mastering Karma, which presents the fundamental principles of the Jan Karma Doctrine. And I'm super excited to have Subhash with us today to learn all about Jainism and how to master our karma. I'm happy to finally connect with you. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm super excited to talk about something. We really haven't talked about Jainism. I love the study of different religions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably, you know, the four faiths which they originated from India. And I think most people know at least one faith because that they hear quite a lot called Hinduism. So one of the faiths which originated in India was Hinduism. Is it the oldest faith? No, I think that that's a debate. I think every religion wants to say, no, we are the oldest. So that is debatable. But yeah, I think Western people probably agree, probably Hindu is probably the oldest. But there is three more faith which originated in India. The second faith, most Westerners they start knowing for the last 30 years, is called Buddhism. Because they start doing yoga and meditation, things like that. So they became a little more familiar with Buddhism, also started from India. But very few people know that there was another faith which is fairly ancient and at least they think they are ancient than the other two faiths is called Jainism. So Jainism also is a very ancient faith, a very well developed faith. Jainism say that it was revived by our last, like your apostles, we have, we call Tirthankara. There, is, there was a last apostle in our faith, which was Mahavira. And Mahavira and Buddha, they were contemporary. They were together and they saw each other, they met each other, they knew each other. So most Western historians agree that definitely Jainism is as old as Buddhism. And you know, Buddhism is definitely about 2,500 years old, is very old religion. Now historians start agreeing there was probably there was another fellow earlier than Mahavira who started this faith which was about 3,000 years ago. But it's fairly ancient religion. Everybody agrees that the Buddha and Mahavira, they were contemporary. So it is a definitely 2,500 years old faith. So it's a very, very old religion. The only thing is the fo- number of followers of this faith are not very large. And fourth one is a fairly recent faith, which was originated called Sikhism. So this faith, Sikhism, is originated about 500 years ago. So it's fairly recent. So there are four faiths which originated in India. Three faiths are fairly ancient. Hindus, Buddhism, and Jainism. And Sikhism is is a fairly recent faith. Who is the Mahabharata? Where would that fall under? Mahabharata is a epic, a Hindu epic. And we really don't know when this, that epic was written, so really nobody knows that. Is a epic, we really don't know whether the 
were really there, they were real or not, kind of debatable. And one of the character in Mahabharata is Krishna, because Gita, one of their famous scripture in Hinduism, is in Mahabharata. And so, but it's, we really don't know when Mahabharata written. And so we, they, we really can't say how old is this Mahabharata. But again, he, Hindus, they, they say, it's, yeah, it's one of their oldest uh, epic they have. I, I just recently read into the story of the princes and all of the wives and the children. Mm -hmm. And I just, I liked the story. Yeah, I think most faith will have some stories because it's easy to explain the basics of the faith through stories because some of these concepts can be a little complicated. So if you build up some stories and you, that you can convey the message through stories, so it's fairly common in most faith scriptures, they will have stories. So like in that. general also, we have one section of our scriptures which talk, deals with the stories only. And they tell these details of the stories. But again, if what somebody wants to go a little deeper, I think you'll have to go beyond the stories to really understand this faith. That's the main problem. And the main difference between Hinduism and Jainism is in the belief in God. That these two faiths, Jainism and Buddhism, they don't believe in God. That's the difference. So we don't believe in God. And that's the main difference between the Western religion, your Abrahamic religion, all these three faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Muslim or Islam, they believe in God. And similarly, Hinduism also believe in God. And of course, they have several versions. They believe in one God. They believe in multiple gods. They have so many gods that you won't <laughs> be really, what number is 33 million gods. So I don't know which story to believe. So they believe in God. But surprisingly, these two faiths, Jainism and Buddhism, they don't believe in God. That's the main thing. And that, that becomes a little bit complicated because is quite different because everybody thinks to create something you need a creator. Okay, yes. So who created this universe? That's the main thing that they think, oh, somebody created this universe. But the question we ask, Jain ask, if you need a creator to create something, then you need a creator of the creator also because somebody must have created the God. And okay, then you say, oh, yeah, okay, there was another person who created the God, then the, who created that? Again, I think in every faith, you will have to start with certain presupposition. There is some faith, belief system. That is fine. It's okay. You believe in that there was somebody who created the universe, fine. We believe, no, this universe was there all the time, and this universe will remain all the time. So you really don't need any creator, because if it is eternal... And it was there un uncreated, it was there all the time, then why do you need a creator? Surprisingly, even Buddhism, they also don't believe in God. So Jainism and Buddhism, because these two are contemporary, the founders, they ex exchange ideas and they both agreed, I think, somehow that, yeah, they don't, there is no God. And actually, we created God, not God created us. That's the main difference. <laughs> Before even humans were on the, on the universe, there was no God at that time. Nobody knew God. So we created God. As a human being, we create, We needed something. Oh, we start asking questions. Oh, oh how, who created this thing? Okay. So we couldn't find the answers. They said, oh, yeah, there was something, somebody who created the God, and we uh, created this universe, and we call it God. It's fine. There's nothing wrong. So that's the main difference. Basically, so most faith, they believe in God, which is okay. And we believe, no, that there is no creator. And the universe was there uncreated and it will remain forever. Okay. You, like most faiths, believe in reincarnation. Yeah. You see, all these four faiths which originated in India, they believe in a law of karma. So they believe in karma doctrine of law of karma. So all four faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, all four faiths believe in karma. And once you believe in karma, they say, you know, because you will not bear the consequences of your action in this life. So those 
you'll have to come back again in future life. So they cannot really explain without reincarnation. So all these four faiths, they are. So they believe in reincarnation. There is no doubt about it. And that because they think that suppose you did some action and somebody shot you and you are not able to really reap the fruit of your past karma, then there are some consequences which are not take, taken care. So you have to come back because you did this some act and you did bear the fruit. So the karma doctrine and reincarnation goes side by side. One cannot survive without the other. If you believe in karma doctrine, you have to believe in reincarnation. That's the main problem. So what does karma mean to you? Karma is a Sanskrit word. It means action. So we do action all the time. And so we, instead of saying I am doing, for example, I am doing talking to you. So I am doing action of talking. You are listening to me. You are doing action of listening. So we are doing action. So we do keep doing action all the time. So instead of using the word action, we say we do karma all the time. So karma means action, basically. And the important thing is every action will have consequences. Mm -hmm. And that's what this law of karma or karma doctrine tells us. And you have to bear those consequences in the future. Okay, so is there some sort of doctrine or scripture or any kind of ancient text that goes along with Jainism? Yeah, you see, again, you will find that there's another problem in first three, which are the oldest religions, there is not a single text. That's mm -hmm. the main problem, just like Bible or Quran or Torah in, in your Western faith. In Indian faith, except Sikhism, they have one book. Yeah. So, yeah, because it's a fairly recent. So, and so they had one book. You can find all the details in one book. But in these three religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, there is not a single text. So you have to definitely read several texts to really to understand this faith. That's the main problem. So to, to answer your question, that, yeah, there is not a single text I can say, but later on that we can definitely find one or two texts that if you read those couple texts, then you at least will understand the basic of these faiths. So depending upon how deep you want to go into that particular faith, for example, in Mahabharata, this Gita thing, if you read Gita, you will get some idea what Hinduism is. So similarly, we have one text which you can read, you will get some idea, but but will not say, no, this is the only book we have. And okay. that's the main. We'll say, yeah, you can get idea of reading this book, but still you will have to read some additional books. So was it originally from like a Sanskrit, um, if there was teachings? Yeah, you see, again, all these three faiths, which are more, uh, fairly ancient faith, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, they were written in different scripts. Hinduism used Sanskrit. Buddhism used called language called Pali, P-A-L-I, Pali. And Jainism used called Prakritic. So they are three different. They are wow. very similar. They are very similar to Sanskrit but they are different language because they are local dialects mm -hmm. one was spoken at that time. So right. they wrote these scriptures in the language which was spoken at that time. So yeah. at Buddhist time where Buddhist the, the people were talking Pali, so they wrote their scriptures in Pali. In Jenny's case, they were talking Prakritic, so they wrote in this Prakritic language. So I would say, yeah, all these three different faiths, they have different language, which is not very different, which is very similar to San Sanskrit. So they are quite similar. Now, do, do Jainism have any deities that resemble, you know, some sort of angel? No, you see, the distinction, we definitely want that if you understand the purpose of life, why we are here, then you can understand what we are talking about. Just like in, in Christianity also, they say that you are born as a sinner because Adam and Eve, they didn't follow some rules and 
we are born as a sinner. Every one of us is sinner. That's what in Christianity is. We also call that every human being carries some karmic debt. You see, we, we use instead of sin, we use a term called karmic debt. Everybody carries a karmic debt because they did some deed in the past. And due to those deeds, they collected some karmic debt. So in Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, this is what they call moksha, nirvana or salvation or you become pure soul. So my soul is impure because my soul carries some karmic debt. So once I get rid of this karmic debt doing some good actions, then my karmic debt will become zero and my soul will become pure soul. So every soul can has a potential to become pure soul. And those pure soul, they cannot really do anything. They don't act like deity or angel or God. Like this. They cannot do anything for yourself. They just basically, they are pure soul. So they don't have what we call this pain and suffering. So they are free of pain and suffering. See the title of my book, this inner peace. This inner peace is basically once the soul becomes pure soul, then it attains inner peace. And then inner peace is a different thing. This what we call happiness, which we get through our all these senses. If I see something good or sometimes eat something good, I feel good. So these are sensual pleasure. These are not really inner peace. So we are trying to find inner peace, which is the characteristic of soul, not of body. We are most of the time think, oh, I am the body. Who, who am I? Oh, I'm that tall. I'm, my name is this. I'm a this color. I, all this I talk about body. But we keep forgetting there is another thing beside body. Sense and of soul. Keep, yeah. So <laughs> because this, this table sitting in front of me, I mean, they, they, they doesn't have soul. And surprisingly, nobody really talks about the soul. We do every you get up early in the morning, you just do all those all the time you care of your body, you really don't pay any attention to your soul. And that's the main problem. And this is what, at least in my book, that I address that we'll have to take care of our soul, which is more important than body. If you want really what I call inner peace, then it has to be through soul. So that's that's kind of like in Gnosticism, where I found where Jesus was teaching the inner journey, You're that right. it was, the kingdom was found inside of you. Yep. And, you know, but yet, you know, what we're taught, you know, in the dogma of religion is that everything is outside of you. So everyone's always searching for everything outside, their happiness, their success, but the soul work, right? The evolution of your soul, not just in this life, but overall is all found within. And this is where the peace lies. Yes, right. Exactly. And again, depending upon your starting assumption, because if you believe in God and then you say, God takes care of all these consequences and actions because he keeps the account, then you need not to really worry about too much about karma doctrine because somebody will keeping the account and he's doing all these things and he give the judgment and then you go to hell or heaven or whatever you need not to worry about but these two faith buddhism and jainism because they don't believe in god and they believe in karma doctrine then question is, oh boy, that who who keeps this account that what type of action you did and what kind of reward or punishment you will get? So because if there is no God, so now we know a little bit more about body because we have another body inside which we call genetic body. And we know the genetic body has a lot of information. A tiny molecule of your DNA it has so many, it, you won't believe that what is included in your DNA is tremendous amount of information. So in Jainism, we also believe beside genetic body, there is another body, which we call karmic body. And that karmic body keeps everything, the account of all your actions, all your karmas, what type of karma you did. So all those accounting is done with this with this karmic body. So we, in order to understand how this law of karma works, 
then you have to understand this karmic body. Is it like an Akashic body? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you see, that's the main problem in Jenny is because we cannot really, genetic body we can see now because t- through microscope and electronic microscope, we can at least see what we are, they are talking about. But, but this karmic body is very, very fine. It's so fine, all this existing instrument, you can't see this karmic body. So it's still everything is in imagination. Oh, there is a body. But the kind of details they gave give you, then I think you say that makes sense. Because scientists also have this problem because scientists found they talk about this mass or energy in the universe and they talk about 96% mass energy is called dark matter and dark energy. 96% of the mass and energy of this universe, they, they can't see. Mm-hmm. They also only can observe and see only 4%. So they are talking about what they call these new particle, God particle, or this particle, whatever they're calling these days. Yeah. So they think that all this space is filled with this fine matter. And that's what Denism also believe that that fine matter which scientists are talking about uh-huh. is probably that matter, our karmic bodies is made up of that matter. I agree. I have scalar energy. Tesla, uh, yeah, Nikola right. Tesla, he definitely understood. Yeah. I want to ask you, genetics, our ancestors, how much of our ancestors' karma are we carrying within our journey? In Jainism, uh, I, I can say probably in Buddhism, in Jainism, when you die, you leave your body here. It doesn't go with your soul. And suppose in next life, depending upon what type of action I did in this life, if I did good action, probably I will be born as a human being again. But if I did very bad action, probably I will be born as an animal or insect. Because in genes, depending upon your action, you can become very primitive type of life in the next life. And you can come back as a human being also. You can go even heaven. Maybe though you would decide to go back into the same lineage to heal the karma if there was something. No, you wouldn't. When the soul leaves the body at, at death, it cannot carry any any matter with it. Okay. It, it okay. carries only very fine matter. It carries karmic body. And in Jenny's karmic body has no mass. It's a massless. Okay. I follow so, you. Yeah, that's and I think scientists also start agreeing now that there is a lot of matter in this universe which is massless. So, so this 90% dark matter and dark energy, there is a lot of matter which has no mass. Mm-hmm. So so looks like is what Jainism is saying that karmic body is massless is a possibility because scientists are also talking about so okay. this karmic body just take kind of a information. It carries the information about the action you did in your past life. Mm-hmm. And you just take that karmic body. The soul takes karmic body with it mm-hmm. and then born again. And because that information is there in karmic body. So just to start is the next life, the next okay. reincarnation. So that's the but idea. You, in but within the DNA that your mother and father that you are... Mm-hmm aside from the soul thing I had to work through some stuff that was became patterns in my Mm -hmm. family you know from Mm -hmm. generation and it was very powerful to be the first woman say to do certain things and it is just overall I think the feminine energy is rising and actually, we had a beautiful woman come on our podcast. Uh, she wrote a book called The Roaring Goddess. And talked about the women in India, how mm-hmm. there are so many goddesses and mm-hmm. women were honored and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in mm-hmm. certain religious establishments, you know, I mean, gosh, it wasn't that long ago. Women weren't even allowed in that temple. Mm-hmm. And I know that I'm more familiar with the Buddhists in Jainism, where are they with, you know, that equality? Yeah, no, I think they they really didn't make any distinction 
between men and women when they started and so you could become nun so they were nun and monks mm -hmm. in in that group so they they so they both uh, men and women they became they start following this faith so yes. they, they, there was no discrimination at all so they put both men and women they you see they know this pure soul pure soul has no gender mm -hmm. cuz you might come back as either one <laughs> yes definitely oh, yeah you can be, come back as a insect plant life because we believe we mean in the plant has a life and we believe plant as a living being so in genesis you can we define this different type of lives depending upon how many senses you have you can have one sense two senses three senses four and five maximum senses are five we know human being have five senses you know touch taste smell color and hearing so we have these five senses so we are five sense living being the plant plant have only one sense it has touch it doesn't taste it has it can't smell it can't see it can't hear but it has one sense there are certain insects they eat they have mouth but they can eat but they don't have hearing power or smelling power but then you get this and three sense living beings then reptile for example reptile they are four sense living beings they can't hear you see snake or lizard they can't hear if you clap they have only four senses but then of course then you have all these animal kingdom yeah. they become five sense living so beings so where does karma fall in obviously a plant can't have karma can it all living being doing action they oh. they do only one type of action because they have you see we have three means of action mind body and speech i can do action with my mind i can do action with my i'm talking to you this is an action and i can do action with my body so there are three different means of action i have but plant have only one means of action just body it doesn't have speech it doesn't have mind so he can do action only with body it looking for sun it will bend where the sunlight is coming it will go there roots will go towards so we know all these plants they have this sense of touch because if you plant a seed somewhere and they know the water is on that side so the root will go on that side it won't go the other way so it can sense that okay water is there and it roots will go on that direction if the solar light is there they bend on that side so they have sense there is no doubt yeah. but they have only one sense and they are doing these actions because they have to survive in order to survive they have to eat they have, everybody has to eat something so they are eating thing for plant is basically this photosynthesis Uh, solar energy and they synthesize but they have to eat something they have to get energy from somewhere so they are doing action the, when we say action there are two types there is a physical action and there is psychic action also because you have a soul so soul is also contributing your action when you are doing any action you have certain intention certain desire certain motivation so plant want to send its roots in the direction of water it has attachment in the dough i have how to survive yeah. i have to go there so wow. so he doing those action with some intention definitely and wow. so that intention is very important the motivation is very important in action and depending on your motivation you can define whether your action is good or bad you see in order to get consequences do you need to know whether you did a good action or bad action and good and bad action does not depend on your physical action it depends on your motivation why are you doing that if you trying to hurt somebody that we know is a bad motivation and then we say oh no it's not a good action so in genesis motivation is very very important and in my book you will find a word called moha m o h a moha is a word which tells you what kind of motivation you have why you are doing certain things 
and the intensity of moha controls everything and this moha basically means attachment and aversion things you like you get attached things you hate you don't like them so this attachment and aversion is the main problem and i think the pure soul doesn't have any attachment and aversion he just becomes neutral is have equanimity and doesn't care so we have to get rid of this attachment and aversion mm -hmm. and that's moha and depending upon the intensity of moha you can we can define how good action or how bad action are, are and what kind of consequences you will have and that controls your karmic debt if you do action with less moha then you get less karmic debt if you do action with very large intensity of moha then you get large karmic debt so somehow you have to control your karmic debt through this moha and do these actions without really having lots of attachment and aversion that's the main thing we'll have to talk about in jainism jainism this moha thing is very very important you're a great teacher no no i i'm fully following you yes i can tell how passionate your action is and how and so and when i think about the intention when you were just speaking that is good karma right coming from the soul i can feel it in you yeah but this passion word we have it a, a slightly different word in jainism we call kashai which is in english we will call passion but i will call negative passion negative passions are not good if you are right. angry angry to become angry is also passion oh, which yeah. is a negative passion right competition and to win yeah, right. and the best yeah, yeah. and have the most right yeah so we we'll have to make a distinction between positive emotions and negative emotion or negative passions and positive passions and what i'm talking about this moha i'm talking about negative negative passions right. uh, which are like anger greed deceit these kind of things yeah and our world especially here in the west is set up for us to fail in that moa because you know it's like go to school get your yes. degrees and be the best make the most you know look the best and we're set up and conditioned for bad moa <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's true yeah in india we have this jainism but still most people are so engrossed in their daily life it never occurs to us that we have a soul we all the time every single person thinks oh i am the body that's it and you take care of your body and everything i do for my body i just never care about my soul only recently i would say for the last one year or so at times now i start thinking about soul and i start doing slight at least thinking about that i should do something for my soul so i'm cutting down i'm trying to live with less my motto is try to live with less minimalist and, and so that's the important thing and i that's what i'm trying to do here and you see you will see my dress here and now every day i just wear only this dress i'm trying to give up all clothing and i i just want to just have only one type of dress so it is cutting down my requirements why should i have my closet full of all those different dresses so bad my closet is so bad i don't yeah, even right. know what's so, in there exactly <laughs> so and now you don't believe i have started doing this thing only for the last couple months yeah. and i am feel so good every oh. morning i just get up i shave take so i need not to worry about what i have to wear today it just the same yeah. thing so <laughs> i, I think it. life become so easy in the beginning my community it took me about one week now everybody knows in my community oh this fellow he has only this one dress <laughs> so they know me so there is no problem everybody thinks they are fine he is okay nothing wrong if he just want to wear that dress nothing wrong and really life has become fairly easy i have nothing to worry about what what i have to wear tomorrow because i know okay so starting a small thing really makes a lot of difference so i am starting doing these things instead of eating all the time i just say oh yeah i will eat fixed time because there is another things is coming up that if you want to live longer 
you'll have to eat less. The less you eat, the, the longer your life is. Because our eating habits are so bad. We keep eating all the time and don't do any physical exercise. Now I start worrying about a little bit about all these things. Are you, I believe I'm right when I say that you also are vegetarian or... Vegan. You see, Jenny's, because Jenny's believe that every living being has a soul, so you don't want to kill anything. So Jainism cannot eat meat. So they, Jains are vegetarian. Okay. But they do take dairy products. But now we start telling them that even dairy products, you are causing harm to animals. The way the animals are raised, yes. the environment yes. is so bad. So some, I would say probably 5 or 10% Jains, at least in, in the US, are now vegan. I'm vegan. Okay. But I became vegan only the last three, four years. Okay. I have little bit thing there because when I go out. Yeah, and it's hard. Then I say, okay, suppose I go to my sister's place and yeah. sister, some something in, in the food which has dairy right. product. I don't really, I said, okay, today at this hour, I'm, I'm, not, I'm vegetarian, no. I'm, I'm not vegan. So I'm not very strict vegan that I won't do anything. At home, I'm vegan. Yeah, you're so intense. I'm little, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little flexible in this thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, when if there was like a really good bowl of ice cream in front of you, that your niece made or something special for you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Yeah. If somebody <laughs> really made for you, because I was in, in India la last month and I was there. So everybody there eat dairy products. And when I go there, they serve me something. To make a special thing for me is kind of it. I said, no, don't you need not to make today. I am not vegan. So that's been like an involving thing because the mass production could see how it would be okay if you had a cow and you were just, yeah. you know, yeah, you right, know, right. but I mean, gotten out of control that it is abusive and right, right. Yeah. Like, what did it ask you? Where did the name Jainism come from and what does it mean? Okay. You see. According to Jainism, they say the word, the Jainism came word from Jina, J-I-N-A. Okay. Jina. Jina means the fellow who has conquered his desires, uh, these attachment and aversion. So he really didn't have any desires, didn't have like and dislike. Soul became pure soul. Pure. So that's the word Jina. Is, I think is a Prakritic, again, this language, three languages, Sanskrit, Prakritic, and Pali. In Prakritic, Jina is the word who has conquered his desires. Okay. Was he a person at one yeah, point? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Everybody, yeah, yeah. The Mahavira was the person. Yes. And according to Jainism, every person, every, every living being has same identical soul. Souls are no different. The only thing... Every living being is carrying different amount of karmic debt. You, you are ca carrying karmic debt. I am carrying karmic debt. The more karmic debt you carry, the worse you are. So if I, get, when I die and if I die with very large karmic debt, I am positive that I will be born as an insect. But if I die with a less karmic debt, the chances are that I will be born again as a human being. So in Jen is, yeah, this karmic debt is the most important thing. And mm -hmm. every, every living being, all these plant life, everybody has same soul. And every soul can become pure soul. So the, everybody will just get rid of this karmic debt. Yeah. And so earlier you get rid of the karmic debt, earlier you will get the inner peace and then you need not to worry about. So this is the whole idea. So you wrote, you wrote this book and you tell the story of an American student that you had. I feel like I'm the American student right now. You are just full of wisdom and I appreciate it. You taking the time to share all of this wisdom with me, but how can one work on their karmic debt? What would be an example of someone who, I don't know. I mean, how do you even know that you have it in your current life? And if you do discover that you feel like you have a lot or can you even know? Yeah, but you see, that's what I'm saying. Now my motto is live with less. Okay. That's the thing. 
and the bet if i keep controlling my desire requirements i am definitely reducing my karmic debt so in order to reduce my karmic debt i have to draw a line that i don't want wealth beyond this limit you know, the problem is when i got a job i was happy i got but then i was getting certain amount but it was never enough so once i got that amount i wanted more then i got more uh, my salary increase but i want more so that thing you keep wanting more 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 and there is no end to it the better is that you start drawing this line okay once i get this that much then i don't want to really care for more so that's the starting point and once you go there then you start re reducing your requirement and as you go to reduce your requirement then you are in the right direction and eventually then definitely you can see the less desires you have less requirements you will have you more desire you will need more 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 most people can relate that when you clean up a room and you get rid of stuff and send it to the goodwill not only does the space feel better but you feel better you feel exactly. this freedom exactly. from the stuff from the attachment yes. of the stuff yes. exactly so exactly. you're making space mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. your physical and also within exactly i couldn't say anything better that's the way you need to go well i i just heard it from you you said it <laughs> so one other thing so who said was it uh the dalai lama or was it buddha who said attachment is the root to all suffering yes yeah it is a from buddha and because i just told you that these two fellow mahavira and buddha they were contemporary yeah. they agreed certain points but certain points of course they didn't agree yeah this is okay in jainis we go little bit extra step to reduce our requirement mm. buddhists they don't need they think no you need not to reduce your requirement that much jainis a little bit more stringent in in rules like i've heard of uh, maybe this you know we're in america so we see you know whatever they want us to say but i actually saw one time that someone was actually taking a broom and actually sweeping in front of them so that they wouldn't step on insect right. insect yeah. yeah this is yeah so jain monks they carry a broom all jain monks and so they very careful when they walk when they sit down everything they use their brooms make sure they don't kill anybody mm -hmm. but in jainism also there is one one sect they don't even wear clothes they are naked our monks in one group they are naked they don't have anything they don't have nothing wow yeah so there there are about 500 monks jain monks in india which are naked they live in society they live in society they live there because the society somebody has to feed them because they don't have anything nothing naked they sleep on the floor they no. sleep on the floor and they just eat only once a day they drink only once a day wow. and so somebody has so and so you can see there they have no requirement their requirement is just one meal per day that's the only requirement they have so, so the society jain society provide them one meal a day they do that whatever they want to do so oh my God. you they, uh, yeah that's i'm saying our faith goes to that that extreme that eventually you don't own anything wow i get it so they are really truly freeing themselves of all karma because they would like to in their next probability be pureness and be one with yeah the but cosmos. again one has to be careful externally they are doing those things internally is very important why you are naked and why you are eating one time a day if you are trying to impress somebody or you want to get fame or to so then is not a good intention Yeah, and the way you are doing, you know, I have to do out to make your soul pure soul. That's the purpose. Yeah, that you are doing very good. So one has to be careful that this moha is very important. And I think I know definitely there are our some monks 
which has very little moha and I, I think they are doing pretty good. But I would say one has to be little careful. There are still some monks which have not really reached that stage of moha. They still need to work a little bit more. <laughs> so what I'm hearing though, that little more may be the ego. Yeah, exactly. This moha, one of the component of moha is ego. Okay. Because as long as you relate your yourself to your body, not your soul, that is ego. Because ego is basically telling you, oh no, you are just body. Don't worry about soul. Yeah. And so we relate everything. This what we call self. Self means my body is self, but the self is different than body. And that ego comes in there. So the, yeah, that's it. So one has to take care of if ego first that you start believing in soul. You need your body, but soul is more important than body. That's the important thing. So what's interesting is like the Cathars. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I think actually several groups that came off of ancient mystery schools, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. believed that we were stuck in this body. And so they didn't want to procreate. And the goal was to free yourself mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. this body, you know, from having to keep doing this body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and then the ultimate, you know, would be to become pure, right? Sure, um, sure, 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 and sure, so, sure. Which, which is the word Cathar. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. It's interesting how there are many similarities around all of the world that okay. have core beliefs, like intention, right? So what I'm getting from you, intention and impermanence. Yeah. And, but and yeah, again, I think I would just go to this word moha in my book because moha is basically moha. the thing. And moha includes two things, ego. Okay. Yeah. One component is ego, and second component is, is negative passions, negative passions, negative. anger, greed, deceit, all these things. So these two are very important. You shouldn't really, this attachment and aversion is the main problem. You shouldn't get attached to anything. People? And, yeah, you see, attachment is always create problem. I mean, because I always feel that if I'm attached too much to people, that when they begin to grow and when they begin to even um, transfer into the next um, life or whatever, wherever they're mm -hmm. going, um, if we are so attached that we are so devastated, I've seen this in a lot of people. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So you see, initially, there can be two kinds of attachment. One, attachment to good things. To help somebody is attachment. But again, eventually, that helping somebody also can create some problem. So eventually, even helping, you need to reach a stage where that attachment is also gone. Though this is good for those people. But again, regarding your karmic debt, because any, yeah, yeah, karmic debt will be there. So the yeah. karmic that becomes zero, then you'll see you won't have any attachment or aversion. You know, we talk to a lot of people and I help a lot of people. And a lot of times people come to awakening yeah. mm -hmm. through pain. They're stripped where all that is left, right, is the soul, you know, but mm -hmm. they had to go a lot to get there. So, you know, when you see someone, I've had people, you know, who say, my God, like, what did I do in my past life that was so bad that I have to go through all of these mm -hmm. hard things? Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. they reach a point where they are the most peaceful. So part of the journey. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think once people are in pain, I consider this as an opportunity to learn. Those people who never had pain, they really didn't get a chance to learn anything. They lived a very happy life and they never thought about anything else. Mm. But those who are in pain, they at least, they give them a chance to think about why you have so much pain. And that kind of a thinking, going back and understanding what the life means, yeah. then that they, oh yeah. So then they try to understand what, what's going on and they try to modify their actions. And that's what we want to do basically once they understand, oh, because this karmic debt I carry is the problem and I have to reduce this karmic debt. And once they understand this, the idea is to reduce karmic debt and then they move in the right direction. And then they we eventually find one day, oh, yeah, now I feel much better than what I used to do. And that's the whole idea. It's basically, so I would say, yeah, 
Did you have to go through a lot of your own personal um, karmic debt in this life? Yes, I I think uh, the reason somehow I don't know why I have this notion that I have done some the uh, some actions which I shouldn't have done. And my feeling is that I collected some large karmic debt doing those actions. And if I want to be born uh, as a human being, I have to somehow reduce my karmic debt. And so the for, for the last few months and my remaining life, I decided that the only way I can reduce my karmic debt, that I control my desires or not. So I start living with this motto that try to live with less. And I think I'm gradually, I'm hoping in the next few years, I will be able to reduce my karmic debt so that at least there is a good possibility I will be born as a human being. So I, yeah, I am. I definitely, at least last few months, have been thinking a lot about it. And I'm changing my thinking and living style. And hopefully, uh, if I talk to you next year, I can tell you that whether I have reached some that stage or not, or I'm going back to my previous life. So I think it's too early to tell which. But right now, I'm definitely trying to reduce my karmic debt. Was your did, was, is this something you were taught as a child, or did you come into this as an adult? You see, when I I came to the U.S. at that time, nobody knew what karma here. I'm talking about I came in '67, okay, 55 years ago, and very few people knew the word karma. They didn't know what I'm talking about. So they asked me, well, "What is this karma you are talking about? Why you are vegetarian? Why you don't eat these things?" And also, so it took me a time to really because. I was raised in that atmosphere, but I didn't know why I was doing those things. Mm. But then I start reading. And once I start reading, I have more questions than I, I, I was able to solve. So I had so many questions in karma doctrine. So it forced me to really work, took an early retirement because in my job, there was no age I could, could have worked longer. But then I wanted to work on karma. So I took retired in 2003. So I'm already 19 years in retirement. And during the last like I have been working, reading and writing a lot. And I learned a lot about this karma doctrine. And now I know that even in my genes, I don't think every action, every consequence is covered by karma doctrine, not. Suppose you have an accident or you have a flood or fire or earthquake. That's not controlled by karma, but people somehow believe they try to relate everything to karma doctrine. So I'm trying to tell them that no, everything is not controlled by karma. There are only certain consequences which are controlled by karma and certain consequences are not. Like what you can control when you can't yeah. control right. the weather. Yes, I understand. Right. And now it's time for Break That Shit Down. My message is basically if try to learn to live with less because this world is going in the wrong direction. If everybody wants more, 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 there is no way this earth resources are finite resources. And you simply cannot really keep consuming and without hurting the earth. So there is only way, one way for survival. I think there is no, no other option. Everybody has to start living with less. And once we decide, oh yeah, that's the way we want to go, just live with less, I think things will improve by itself. So uh, the message I want to convey to everyone, just try to live with less rather than get more and more and more. And, and that's the main problem. Yes, that's a great message to start out 2023. You know, it seems like the younger generation, they are yeah, more. Men. Yeah, I think I have some hope with the younger generation, yeah, sure. My generation, we were spoiled. <laughs> 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 now you've inspired me to go in and donate some more things today to someone else who wants more. <laughs> Saposh, you have been just a blessing and I've really enjoyed our conversation very much. Can you tell our listeners where they can buy your book, 
the path to inner peace, mastering karma, which I think you've demonstrated that very well here in this interview. And tell our listeners where they could find you. Oh, I think um, send an email message and I, I'm eager to answer their question because the only way we can learn from each other is by asking questions. So they can write me anytime. And of course, my book is available on Amazon or this Barnes and Novels. I will put the links to everything in the show notes so okay. that everyone will have that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shana. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for being with us today. We hope you will come back next week. If you like what you hear, don't forget to rate, like, and subscribe. Thank you. We rise to lift you up. Thanks for listening.